So that's my picture up by the XD back in just shows you how long ago it's been. You can tell it's not a very high quality picture. Um, so these are the permanent snaps that the theory go back in 1988, as mentioned, Nick Karp, which Karp was the leader of the group. He worked on incompleteness, obviously, algorithms, randomized algorithms. Computational molecular biology and genomics is what he eventually ended up doing. He did a lot of other stuff in between. And Lenore was a key member of the group as well. She did this fantastic book. She wrote a lot of it at the complexity and real computation with all of her co-authors, including herself as the first co-author, together with uh, Cooper and Shu and Snail, and then forward by Richard Carver, interestingly enough, and myself. So I'll talk a lot about myself in this talk, so I won't say much about that. Uh, Dick Ditt is unfortunately not able to be here to represent the figure. It would have been great if he could have been. But, uh, so he wanted me to read out this statement for him. My association with ICSI began in 1988 when founding director Jerry Feldman decided to include an algorithms group at the Institute. I was the initial group leader, succeeded by Mike Bluby. Lenore Blum was a charter member of the group, and Jerry provided significant financial support that allowed the group to run a thriving visiting program for many years. In 1998, Scott Schenker's invitation to join the excellent ICSI networking group enabled me to work out my return to Berkeley from the University of Washington. And I remain happily at ICSI until 12, 2012. I will always be grateful to Director Nelson Morgan for his personal support and enlightened leadership for that experience. It doesn't really capture all that went on. There was a lot of really interesting stuff that not captured here. And I'd like to personally <coughs> sort of call out to both Jerry and to Nelson no, no, for their fantastic leadership during this period. Uh, um, and there's a lot more they didn't talk about that went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and they dealt with it. Uh, so there are a lot of visitors that you know from distinguished bull, which means they're going to put a little yell in the tooth to just starting so they're really green. Um, researchers, postdocs, grad students from across the country, Germany, Italy, elsewhere, U.S., Israel, Canada, Sweden. And this is not all of them, just a few that visited uh, the, the theory group during the period I was there, including Friedhelm and Merrick and Emil Bessel and Amit Shapovalki and all these other visitors. Fantastic set of collaborators. It was just a really interesting time at ICSI. Uh, my focus at ICSI, this is taken directly from my web page that's still up there from all those years ago. Uh, I had listed cryptography and security, coding theory, transmission protocols. I put them in a separate category here because I'm going to talk a little more about them. But I worked on a lot of other stuff. And it seems like, oh, I just can do everything. It's not true. It was just because we had these, all these fantastic collaborators. There was such an excitement in the, the institute at that point. There were so many visitors coming through for the summer. Now, I didn't have to do that much to do these collaborations, but you could just get going. Off you go. It was amazing. So, <laughs> this is something where there was a conference. One of the grad students from Berkeley, for Bakker Rogge, who's now a professor at the University of Waterloo, got bored and started going through the proceedings and saw these phrases in different papers in this conference proceedings about my work. So he put together this strange poem, <laughs> which was sort of interesting and funny. And this was actually published in the uh, SIGAT News in 1990. <laughs> so cryptography. Uh, when I was here, I learned what quadratic meant. Quadratic meant, when I was writing this book, which is two or three hundred pages, I learned that the amount of effort you have to put into writing something is quadratic in its length, if not worse. And so writing this book was one of the most painful experiences of my life. But it was really written here at ICSI. And it included this nice result, and it included a lot of other results by many other people, but this nice result on pseudorandom generator from any one-way function, which, if you don't know what it means, essentially you take anything that's easy to compute, hard to invert, you can convert it into something that's useful for cryptography, for encrypting things. And it's, uh, you know, I'm one of the, this is the, the Hill paper, H-I-L-L. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors. All the other guys are really world-famous guys, fantastic co-authors. 
Uh, Russell was a grad student here. Johan was a visitor from Spain. <coughs> Lennon never came here, but I don't know if you even know Lennon Levin, but he's the guy who essentially did MP complete. It's both the work of Cook and Karp when he was in Russia before he came over here. Um, and this work was really a lot of fun. <coughs> uh, and it won this Slam Outstanding Paper Award in 2000. So this is the kind of stuff that Ipsy was producing back then. Really high quality, great stuff. Um, in coding theory, that's probably the most thing I put the most effort into when I was at Ipsy. I mean, I put a lot of effort into other stuff, so it was a small fraction, but still a significant fraction. <laughs> there are these three papers that I called out. The first one is more colloquially, and the one's tornado codes. The second one is, is the root of the design of modern codes that are used in practice at this point. And the third was taking that first thing, which is really for erasure codes, and applying it to error correcting codes. And so this one was the first kind of breakthrough in terms of <coughs> a, a low density pairing check code. And these papers won multiple awards and medals. They were the basis for the RAPQ erasure codes that I'll talk about a little bit later. They're also the basis for the LDPC codes that have just been adopted into the 5G standard and are going to be used as the error correcting mechanism within 5G codes. Um, so, again, so this was a different set of characters here. Not the same as the illustrious list we had before. Um, uh, Michael Ritzenmacher <coughs> was a finishing PhD at UC Berkeley again. Spielman was a visiting uh, postdoc at UC Berkeley. Uh, Volker Stemmen was a visitor through the sponsored from the German program, as was Amin Chakrawahi. And their areas had nothing to do with coding theory. None of the graphs was in coding theory before they started this project. Yet, nevertheless, they were able to contribute significantly to this project and really provide something that was important. Uh, and then transmission protocols. We had this joint work. Andres Albanese was, for a short period of time, the lead of a networking group at, at ICSI. And we did this priority encoding transmission project, which is really a practical project. We really built a system where you take a video thing and you send the signal over uh, the internet, <coughs> and you lose packets and you reconstruct things and you show a high quality at the other end. And so this was a, you know, Hannes Blumer was another uh, visitor from the, the German visiting. Uh, Jeff Edmonds was a uh, postdoc from. Uh, Canada, uh, Medusa Dan was a student here, and uh, this was just a theory paper. There are other papers that involved others that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then there was this digital found approach to reliable distribution of bulk data. This was a SIGCOM paper. We had no clue about the SIGCOM community, nothing about what to do there. So we submitted this paper. It's a good idea that you guys don't really know how to write for this community. We'll give you a shepherd. They give us a shepherd. We got it in eventually. And then there was this other paper that was written by a bunch of uh, students and, and, and visitors from other countries. And all these papers had impact going forward. So the first one was actually the original motivation for doing all the coding work on the previous one. It was really a practical thing that motivated getting into this coding stuff. The digital found approach to reliable distribution of both data, you know, our first shot of this eventually won the Zico and Tesla final work 10 years later. So that was pretty. And then the third one turned out to be a key component to some of the streaming work that I did while I was at Qualcomm. So let me talk about some of the success stories. So uh, Christian Leiker, and this is just a small sample. He was a visiting member of the Ipsy network group, and he was a key contributor to the PET project. He actually did all the implementation. I told you we built this real system. This guy worked his butt off to do that. And he did his masters while he was here. And when he went back, to Germany, he ended up being president and CEO of Rosen Schwartz in, in Munich. So, pretty impressive. Didn't hurt that his grandfather was one of the founders of <laughs> Rosen Schwartz, but never <laughs> <laughs> um, Alistair Sinclair is a visiting postdoc to the FC Theory Group, a key contributor to randomized algorithm research. Now he was the founding associate director of the Simons Institute for Theory of Computing. By the way, if you've never seen the Simons, go see it. Fantastic, beautiful building. This guy's really the architect of that thing, really, in terms of redesigning a thing into the place it is today. Yes, Dick was the director and the founding director, and he really was the reason they put it here and so on. This guy is the guy who did all the work. 
Uh, and now, and obviously, he's been a professor at UC Berkeley. In fact, he transitioned from a UC postdoc to a professor at UC Berkeley way back. Great success story. Uh, Paul Dagan was one of my students. <coughs> he came from Toronto. You know, interesting character. He was going to go get his MD after graduating with me and, in Canada. He came here, it opened up his eyes. He came here and he said, oh, Stanford is where I should go get my MD. So that's where he went. He, and then he saw this entrepreneurial activity happening everywhere. So after he finished his degree, even though he was already going on to do heart and brain surgery and all this other stuff, at some point he said, wait a minute, I want to be an entrepreneur. So then he became a serial entrepreneur. And I don't know if this is second or third company, but if this is a, a company, he's the founder and CEO of this company called Mindstrong, which combines his MD experience together with his computer science experience, together with the experience he had from being ICSI. And then there's Amin Shakralati, who was a visiting postdoc of the XC theory group. He key contributor to that coding theory project. He had no background in coding theory. He was really an algebraic <coughs> kind of complexity kind of guy. But it opened up his eyes, it changed his entire career. And after he left here, he went to AT&T and he worked with Thomas uh, uh, Richardson and uh, Rudiger Urbanke to kind of design these, take what we had started here and take that and develop it into these fantastic error correcting codes, which eventually are the things that were actually adopted in 5G. And then after that, when AT&T started to fall apart, he joined my company, Digital Fountain, he was our chief scientist for many years. He was a key contributor to all the technology there. And then eventually he went he for other he went back to Switzerland. He took a professorship at the EPSL. And eventually, based on the digital founding experience, the XE experience was where it all came from, he became founder and CEO of Hamdu, which is where he's at today. So amazing success. A uh, little bit about digital fountain. It, it really spun out of XE. Uh, it's a startup based in the Bay Area that started that. It was really founded based on the Tornado codes, but then we developed these LT codes, rapid codes, and more advanced variants. It was really focused on reliable delivery and video streaming software using rapid codes. We had some amazing, interesting stories back in the day. I can't tell them all, but we actually delivered the digital dailies for Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Fast and Furious. We did defense applications. We were involved in the rescue of Jessica Lynch, and that shouldn't surprise you, but what should surprise you is that's actually public. So whoever made that public actually got into trouble. <laughs> and we're deployed in Global Hawk till today, the, the drone. Um, the IPTV deployments, all the NTTs in Japan, some yeah, IPTV providers in the Netherlands, and satellite data delivery the units, postal service, Sirius XM, and so on. Uh, there's me in Japan holding a phone that actually has our parent, has our software on there. We're receiving uh, broadcast signals over the air. And there's a picture of me and a meme. This is when he'd gone back to the felt We're doing our collaboration. So we're these professorial types, you know, on Lake Geneva with the swabs in the back. And his house is just like a kilometer away from the beautiful side. So Qualcomm acquired Digital Fountain in 2009. There we developed these Raptor Q codes. You can guess where the Q came from. It actually originally Raptor G. Roberto Padovani went to Paul Jacobs and said, we have these Raptor G codes. They're fantastic. And said, Paul said, well, why don't they Q? <laughs> <laughs> They're Q. Which actually made technical sense as well. So they really focused on video streaming and distributed storage kind of applications. There are deployments based on the 3GPP multimedia broadcast multicast services standard, and it was licensed for a variety of use cases, commercial and defense. Okay, now I see the signals are coming. So this was our opening ceremony uh, of the office, which is right around the corner from here, the little Qualcomm Berkeley office a few years ago. You might recognize some of the characters. You see, for example, Dick Carp sitting right next to Stan, right next to Paul Jacobs with me and Ewing. You might recognize Kevin Fall there. Uh, Lawrence is over there on the, the right. We'll talk about him a little bit, just behind John Kennedy. And uh, Roberto Padavani is the gentleman sitting at the desk there. So, uh, fantastic little office. And then you'll see there were also some people from here. <laughs> 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 So 
So just to give you, uh, I'm running out of time. But okay, so what is an erasure? So to understand what raptor codes are, you really have to understand what erasure codes are. So essentially, you've got a piece of data, you pick up, break it up into equal sized pieces, you encode that, so the original data pieces are part of the encoding, and you generate these repair or redundant pieces. And then you transmit those, some pieces are lost, some are received. As long as you receive enough, where enough is the number of pieces in the original data, you can decode or recover the original data. So that's really the idea. A fountain code is you can just generate a bunch of encoding as you must. So you can on the fly keep generating this repair data as much as you'd like. So it's sort of like a water fountain. Where, and then decoding is sort of like putting a cup in there and you can recover, put it, just fill it up and you can recover it. Okay. So Raptor and Raptor Q are the two kind of standardized codes out there. <laughs> Did a lot of work in the ITF over the years. Um, so the uh, Raptor codes are have good recovery properties. The main thing that was really differentiating from codes in the past, they're winning time encoding and decoding. And this means that you can use a large number of, of, of pieces in your original data. And so you can sort of protect into fine granularity. And the Raptor Q codes are just much better in terms of recovery properties, but they have all the other same problems as the Raptor codes. And both of these have been adopted into various commercial standards and more standards this time goes on. So, lastly, I have now no longer at Qualcomm, and I have rejoined ICSI and have started this Corte Lisi's project, which uh, we just launched this <laughs> uh, as a team in uh, September 2018. And one of my sort of laments about Qualcomm is that they didn't promote this technology now. So I don't know if you know anything about Qualcomm, but it has to be a billion dollar idea billion to them before it's really interesting. <laughs> this isn't going to be a billion dollars to them idea, but to ICSI it could be actually quite different. So the idea is to develop a high performance invitation for Raptor Q, the application software around that, and standard schemes. And there's a lot of people interested in this. I'm out there every day finding out more and more. I had a couple of calls today. For um, these are the team members, besides myself, Lawrence Minder, and Pooja Agarwal are sitting up there in the audience. So these are both, were part of the Qualcomm office that are here. They both decided to join the team, which is fantastic. Well, uh, Pooja was an engineer at Qualcomm for 18 years, and she was involved in Flow TV and digital delivery and a bunch of other interesting projects, and she is a high, high quality system engineer who really keeps things organized, real professional. Lawrence, his PhD advisor was Amin. When he was with Amin, he came over to Digital Fountain, did an internship, and did some implementation of the Raptor codes. He went back and finished his PhD. Came to Berkeley and did his postdoc with Alistair. Um, and then after Alistair finished with Alistair, I staffed him. And he did all the Raptor 2 implementation with him Qualcomm. So he is really the world's expert in terms of implementing this stuff. Okay. And with that, I'm done. It says finish, I guess I'll finish. Thank <laughs> you.